to the Tennis IQ Podcast. I'm Josh Berger. And I'm Brian Lomax. And our topic today is talking about the impact of UTR, Universal Tennis Rating, uh, website's universaltennis.com, uh, mainly on players who aspire to play college tennis. And, you know, Josh and I have been talking about this particular topic a bit today and wanted to go through what a what a focus on UTR can do to players, um, some of the challenges with that, and then uh, helping everyone reframe their perspective on it so they can learn to deal with this better. The idea came because I, I received an email recently talking about how a player was essentially you know came home in tears because of um, feeling judged by different things. UTR being one of them, uh, maybe coaches, etc. You know, and this particular athlete is, you know, sophomore, junior in high school and is right in that zone where thinking about college tennis, thinking about the college recruiting process, kind of in the midst of all that. And yeah, there are these systems of evaluation and judgment that exist like UTR. Um, There are college showcases that players can go to uh, and be seen by coaches. There are coaches out there. Um whether the players are emailing them or coaches are emailing the players. So there's this whole kind of system around the college recruitment process um, in which players may be feeling judged or feeling rated. And UTR is a really big part of that. And both Josh and I have been coaches at the college level. And so we understand how UTR is actually used in the recruiting process, and for sure it is used. Um, and I think that's one thing we'll want to make sure, or one of the reasons that we want to talk about this today is that UTR as a rating system is reality. It's here, and it's very likely here to stay. Um, it has proved to be useful for coaches and others. Um, but on the other hand, it hasn't always been super helpful to mood and anxiety for for players, and it, 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 for some, it becomes a real real barrier. So, you know, Josh, as we were thinking about this topic today and discussing it uh, ahead of time, um, it, we went through a number of kind of permutations of you know how UTR can have an impact on players. You know, what what are some of the impacts that you think are, or at least the biggest ones that you've seen in, in players that you're working with? Yeah, um, and and as you said, I think it's important to to preface this this conversation by saying there's you know the, the, there's certainly pros and cons to to this system. I mean, as you said, it's here to stay. It can be certainly a very useful tool. Um, I think for coaches and players alike. Um, I think for for coaches, particularly college coaches, it provides sort of a baseline for um, what you can expect a player to be in, in terms of a certain range. For instance, if a team is looking for players between, you know, let's say UTRs eight and ten, um, and a player is coming in, you know, two points above or two points below that, they they likely won't be the best fit for that team. Um, where you know, so I, I think it, it can provide sort of a baseline, and especially you know, as as college coaches or, or former college coaches actually. Um, for you know for me it, um you know it it one, one thing that's helpful is if you let's say you look you're looking at a player a player emails you from somewhere outside the US let's let's just pick a country let's say Albania there's a player coming from Albania and they're ranked number 6 in Albania um unless you have knowledge of the Albanian tennis system which i would say most U.S. tennis college tennis coaches do not. Um, it's tough to compare what number six in that country, how that compares to, let's say, somebody who's 300 in the U.S. or number 15 in Texas or, you know, or nine in Georgia. So, you know, as as coaches, sure, in the U.S., there are national rankings. There's, you know, USTA has a list of its national rankings. Um, but what, what the UTR does is it, you know, in theory, it puts all players of, of all, you know, all ages and gender 
Um, and, you know, regardless if you're playing your first 10 and under tournament or you're playing in Wimbledon, um, you're all, everyone is on the same rating scale. Um, and it does certainly make it easier when, you know, when you're looking for, you know, that division one or division two, division three, NAIA um, team to assemble when you know that people, you want people approximately of a certain scale or, or certain range. Um, with that being said, it's certainly not a perfect system. I think we'll, we'll get into certain areas that, you know, probably unintended, but have certain uh, negative impacts on players today. For instance, um, you know, it, it certainly has led to certain players pulling out of tournaments at times because they don't want to play certain types of players. Maybe that player is, is rated lower than them significantly, and they feel that that might negative, negatively impact the rating. Um, and I think it's also important, you know, to to mention that, Though it is a factor um, within the college recruitment process, it's only one factor, and there are so many other factors that go into uh, that, that come into play when it comes to the decisions in terms of you know which players are recruited and ultimately selected for a team and scholarship dollars and all of that sort of thing. Well, I think you said it did a good job of setting the table there in terms of the reality of how it's used, right? I think. Um, in my experience as a college coach, getting emails from prospective players, like it or not, UTR was probably one of the first things we would look at. And, uh, you know, I know many coaches, if, if the UTR isn't in the range they're looking at, they don't respond um, to the email. Uh, because, they're, you know, for some teams, there are just too many, too many emails. And, um, the, you know, so like in your example of an eight, range of eight to ten, a lot of the emails a college coach is going to get are from players who are in the six to eight range. And, you know, maybe the school is a stretch. They'd love to play there. Um, maybe they're working on their UTR. Um, but one of the problems with UTR is that it, it is only really telling you where you are in this moment. And even I think that's a mistake that coaches can make. Okay. All right. So so-and-so is a sophomore. But she's not in the eight to ten range, so I'm not going to look at her. That could be a mistake, right? I mean, you know, what's what's the growth potential of this player? UTR can't really tell you that, um, and so it is used for sure. It's one of the first things that gets looked at, and for players who fall into the range that a coach is looking for, then I think it goes to the next step, Josh, which is what are these other factors that matter to our team uh, that will make our team better? What's the kind of player or person that we're looking for? Um, but I think, you know, for me, one of the biggest issues with UTR is this idea of it simply gives you information about where you are today. It doesn't say anything about who you could be. And when we work with athletes, it's always about who you want to be, who you can become. And, you know, obsessing over where your UTR today tends to be a distractor, right? If we look at three possible versions of yourself, who you were, who you are, and who you will become, to me, the most important one is that last one, that, you know, who you want, you know, want to become. UTR is about all about who you are in this moment in time and that you know we can feel judged there and that can create some anxiety and you may know who you want to be right or i want to be on that team that's eight to ten i'm only a six i need to be this and in that moment you're trying to make it's almost like you're trying to make a two-point utr jump in in a day and without understanding that that's just not how it works. And that can become overwhelming, right? You're looking more at the gap rather than what you can control, et cetera. So I think it's understandable that players have this level of um, angst or anxiety. Uh, their mood can be affected by this because um, they want to be at one number. They're not at the number they think they need to be at. And, and the gap is overwhelming. They see the difference between where they are and where they want to be, and they don't know how to get there. And they're so obsessed with sort of the dynamic calculations 
I think that's one troublesome impact, uh, aspect of UTR is that it's constantly updated. And you know, it, you know, when we were talking before, Josh, you you mentioned how many players and parents are not as well educated on the algorithm as they could be. Um, the number your your UTR may move without you playing, and so like, oh, do you understand why it went up or down based on uh, somebody else's activity? Um, so I think it's a uh, I can understand why people struggle with this. It's not something that um, was ever a part of my junior tennis career, and I think you, Josh, I don't think it was part of yours either. Um, and I think we can both under really empathize with players today about how difficult this can be. Definitely. Definitely. And I think, uh, I think you touched on something important that, you know, I'm, let's say that that player who's rated six currently is trying to get up to that, that eight level. Um, they may be dealing with other things rather than just where, just that gap that they're at. Um, expectations can certainly come in play, whether they consider themselves, okay, I, I feel like an eight and I feel like this, this six UTR doesn't really reflect me and my level, or maybe they're hearing that from a parent or they're hearing that from a coach or from the, the people around them, you know, their, their teammates, their, their friends. Um, I mean, it can be very easy to, to look at a player who's, who is that eight UTR player. If we continue this example and say, I'm just as good as them. I should be an eight. And as we've talked about many times in the past, you know, when, when tennis players use words like should, supposed to, need to, I need to be an eight. Um, when, when people talk to themselves in that way, I have to, um, it, it puts a lot of pressure on us and it actually makes it, it has a, you know, it, it ends up becoming a lot more more difficult to actually make those strides in our game because of that added pressure and those ad added expectations. Um, and, you know, I, there are a lot of players that, that maybe have expectations to play at a certain level. Maybe it's division one. Um, maybe it's, you know, maybe they want to play for a certain conference. Um, for instance, you know, Brian and I both come from, from the Northeast, come from New England originally. There's you no know, very competitive division three conference, um, both academically and athletically, the NESCAC conference, where a lot of, you know, New England players uh, will, you know, both both in terms of their academics and their tennis, they know have to be at a, you know, at a high level, and they'll they'll aim for certain schools there, or maybe it's the Ivy League schools. Um, again, those are more local examples. But, um, you know, I, I think whatever the situation is, um, the, you know, having a certain number in mind and maybe seeing that gap between that number that you're at and that number that you're striving for um, can put a lot of pressure on and can, can have certainly a very detrimental impact on how somebody feels about themselves and, you know, sort of how they identify as a player, because rather than, you know, recognizing, okay, I've had some good, good wins recently. I've made some great progress in my game. I'm working on this and this, and I've, you know, now able to hit, you know, th this new type of serve or able to, um, w whatever it is, these new strides in my game, it's, you, you're constantly thinking about that gap of where you have to get. Yeah. And I think that that is, uh, then that can become an overwhelming feeling of how can I get there as quickly as possible? Um, and I've had some of those emails as well from, uh, parents of players who are striving to do this and like, oh yeah, we need to, so-and-so is a sophomore. We need to get her UTR up, UTR up really fast as if that is something that is completely controllable. And unfortunately it's not. I mean, yes, we, you as player have some influence over you, your UTR, just like you have influence over your general performance. You have influence over your ability to win a particular match, but it's not fully within your control. And that always becomes the issue with something like UTR is, are we giving too much of our attention to something that we can't fully control? Are we giving away our emotional and mental state to something that we cannot fully control? And I think that that is true of many players is that um, 
unfortunately, sometimes their mental and emotional state is too dependent on something like their UTR, their feeling of self-worth. Um, and I think it's a really difficult thing to make that a major source of your self-esteem and self-worth when it's something that you can't fully control. Um, and so I think that's where we go through a process of understanding how do we break down improvements in UTR? What is it that you actually can do that you can commit to that if you do so over, the lo- over a long period of time will probably lead to a positive trend in UTR? Um, and can we get more enjoyment out of some of those controllable things? Can we base our self-image and our self-worth on how we're doing with the effort that we're putting into practice with, um, you know, more of the process oriented goals that we're, we're improving this aspect of the game, that aspect of the game. Because if, all right, if I improve my first serve, I, I improve my accuracy of that. I improve the amount of spin. Well, if you keep doing something like that, it will probably have in a, you'll see a positive impact in your UTR at some point, the more you're able to be effective with your serve or your other ground strokes. And so it's not so much about, oh, I got to move my UTR. That doesn't really tell you exactly what to do, except oh, I got to win games and et cetera. And even that doesn't tell you what you need to do. You can't just think win, 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 and all of a sudden winning happens. Because if it were that easy, everybody would have done that by now. And so it's really uh, to, to, I think, affect movement in your UTR, you really got to begin to understand your own sort of personal process and discipline that leads to improvement. Because this is really about who you want to become and and working on that in incremental steps. Tennis is a very difficult sport to master. It takes years to to get to the top. And depending on where you are in your journey, um, you can't really shorten that time frame. It's really hard to say, well, I'm 16, 17, and now I'm all of a sudden going to start paying attention to this. Um, do you think I can get recruited? I don't know. I mean, but what, what I can tell you is that this stuff takes time. And if you're just trying to rush into it by uh, adjusting your UTR, it probably won't happen because you're investing so much of your energy into something that you can't fully control. And so regardless of where you are in your journey, we've got to really conceptualize UTR as just simply a a measure of where you are today. Um, But it's a useful thing to think about in terms of, all right, how can I actually affect change in my UTR? And it goes beyond just winning more matches. It goes down to, you developing that player you want to become and making important controllable efforts toward that and and just being more aware of what you're doing. So I think um, if players can learn to make that shift, perhaps handling this process as a junior tennis player begins to become easier. It won't be easy, right? Like we said, this isn't going away. And I know one of the difficulties that one of the players I worked with, it wasn't so much that he had actually kind of figured out ways of not looking at UTR so much. But the problem was all the other kids at his academy were telling him what his UTR was and talking about it and saying, oh, you know, that guy's this, you're that, you should win or oh, whatever. And it, it's it's not easy. And so there, are, I think there are multiple levels of how one has to – begin to conceptualize UTR as a system in order to be, you know, really healthy, uh, develop a healthy self-image and self-worth and and to continue to work on what you can control. Absolutely. And I'm, I mean, I, I think that that needs to be the goal to be able to use UTR sort of as a tool rather than something that, that, that puts you. pressure on. I mean, yeah. controls you exactly. I mean, I've, I've even seen a club and I'm sure there's other clubs out there where there's a list of all the players or, or many of the, the junior players ranked in terms of UTR on the, on the wall. 
um, in, inside the club. Wow. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, that can have a motivating impact where, okay, almost seeing it as like a ladder, like, okay, this, this player has, you know, wow, wouldn't it be great to get to, you know, where this player is or that I really admire, but can also have certainly a detrimental impact. And I'm glad that you brought up this, this concept that UTR ultimately is uncontrollable, right? We can't, you know, if our job as sports psychology professionals is, okay, I want to raise, you know, help raise this UTR as fast as possible. That's, it's going to be tough because it's out of our control. But if it's, okay, let's focus on that process of becoming the best player I can be, developing, you know, my personal characteristics as well, working on my serve, working on these different areas of my game, raising my tennis IQ, um, becoming that player that I strive to be, your UT, you will win more matches and your UTR will improve. It's It really comes back to this idea of focusing on the process and focusing on those ingredients of playing great tennis and being a great tennis player rather than focusing on sort of the, the final product or where you're trying to go. I think, I think trust is really important that, you know, trusting that focusing on that process, focusing on those controllable factors gives you the best possible chance to have success, to get those outcomes that you want, where if it's, if you're in a third set tiebreaker, and you're focused on, okay, I need to win. I really want to win. I really want to raise my UTR here. And the other player is focused on what they're going to do about it and how they want to play and what their game plan is going to be and what their attitude is going to be. And, and, and this all comes back to, you know, a, a, a conversation that we had actually in episode number two with Brian Barker. Brian Barker, you know, worked with James Blake, who got all the way up to number four in the world. He worked with him for many years. And he talked about the same idea where, you know, let's instead of focusing on results and fixating on it, which I think, you know, when we're focused on UTR, that's ultimately what we're focused on. Uh, let's focus on that process of being the best player we can be and really the best person we can be. And that and let's trust that that is ultimately what gives us a better chance to to get those types of results that we want. Obviously, we're obviously you care about your results. Obviously, you're competitive. Obviously, you want to raise your UTR. Obviously, maybe you want to get into, you know, a na this national level tournament or get seated or play for a certain team. But focusing on that all the time, checking your UTR every day or, or even every week might have actually the opposite impact that you're looking for. Yeah. And, you know, ultimately, even if we're thinking about college tennis, let's remember that's not a great ultimate goal. It's a good goal. You know, and I, and, but I, let's, I think it's a, it's a milestone. Um, you know, I have worked with certain players where they were just so invested in, into getting into the school that they wanted to, that when they did, there was this huge amount of relief and pressure taken off and then they stopped playing. Um, which is really not what that coach who recruited you wants you to do. And it's, and it's not the point. We've missed the point. Um, and that, that's, I would also say, is a poor um, use of goal setting when we're fully invested only in reaching this one thing. And then when we've got it, we stop. Um, we talk often, Josh, on this podcast and I know with our clients, really the goal is to become the best player you can become. Four years of college might be some great training for you. So, yes, we would love to get into the school of our choice. Okay, but maybe that doesn't happen. Maybe you get into a, a, a different school and you play a couple of years there. Maybe you have a great couple of years and you could transfer if you wanted to. You might give yourself some options. Not everybody's going to necessarily follow that traditional path of, well, my UTR is exactly where I wanted it. I got into that school that I wanted to play at and I had a great career um, for years. I mean, that sounds nice, but not everybody's going to fit into that, depending on, on where you are. So it is a real leap of faith, I think, to say, I'm going to put myself into this process of improvement and trust that if I give my all here and I commit to it, um, that I'll get what I want out of it in the end. I'll, I'll be able to maximize what I could do based on who I am. And I think that's what we're asking is 
that you commit to that process, that you commit to something that's fully controllable so that we're not letting UTR control too many of our thoughts, control too many of our emotions, if we can just use it as a, as a tool. So I think one way to bring kind of an overarching perspective to this, Josh, is we have to go back to thinking about what is the point of competition? Like, why do we do this? And it, I think as we've discussed, it's really about you, again, trying to become the best that you can become. And competition is a means to do that. Each match that you play, you know, your whether you win or lose that day is less important than did you learn something today that you can apply to tomorrow's match or next week's match, next week's tournament. No match, in theory, is your last. Hopefully, if you're a truly competitive person, you're going to be excited about playing again tomorrow and then the next day and then the next day. And so if you can use competition as a learning journey and you're simply building experience and you will have many unpleasant experiences in this, you'll have many positive experiences, but they're all experience that can help make you a better player. And that's what competition is. It's not about one game or one match. It's about a lifelong process of testing yourself, learning. Let me test again learn some more. Let me test again. And so if we can have that viewpoint of we are going and playing these tournaments and competing, not to justify my UTR, who I am or where I need to be in two years. It's a journey. It's a learning journey. I'm going to learn something. I'm going to, what do I want to get out of this tournament this weekend? So that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit better after the weekend. And then the next one, what am I going to get out of this one? Am I really going to focus on? And I think the more that we take that approach and and hopefully be less judgmental about ourselves and be more kind and understanding with ourselves and be motivated and committed to being that best version of ourselves, then we can, as you said, learn to use UTR more as a tool rather than something that defines me. Because it doesn't. I, I absolutely no. Well, well said there. Um, I think you know if we if we were to go back to that that player that's that's a six and and feels the need to to be at an eight and feels the need that they already should be an eight. Um, if we, if we think about that mindset that that they're likely to have going into a tournament, they're they're going to be feeling like okay, each match that I play here, I need to win and I it needs to be lopsided. Because I think that's the other part of this, that right. UTR is one of the, you know, it's unique in that it's not just based on whether whether you beat somebody or whether somebody beats you. It's also based on what the score is. So beating somebody 6-0, 6-0 looks a lot different than beating somebody in a tight three-set match. And, and same with losing to somebody, right? Where your, your UTR can actually increase even if you lose a match, if it's competitive against a player who's, you know, uh, rated a lot higher than you. Um, and I, I think what's important, you know, about the, the sort of mindset that, that you're laying out, Brian, where, you know, each experience is really, is really, you know, helping us get to the next one. And, you know, hopefully as a learning experience, um, it, it really reminds me of our conversation uh, with Christina Rolo and Dave DeHaan, this everything is practice mentality where, you know, Every time we're out there on the court, it's practice for the next experience. And, you know, no match that you play, even if it feels like it at the time, even if it's your final high school match, you're not playing college tennis or it's your final college tennis match. uh, There are always play experience. There are always play opportunities. If you want to continue playing, whatever your age, whatever your level, you know, whatever sort of challenges that you have, there, there are always opportunities to play. Um, if, if you want to. So I think having the mentality that everything is practice and every time you're out there is an opportunity to practice your skills, to improve on your skills, to learn from what you're doing today and get better for tomorrow. Um, I think, I think it's, it's the type of mentality that, that leads to 
more progress over time, certainly. I think it also takes a lot of pressure off us. I think it can be very easy as tennis players to have sort of this tunnel vision where every match we play feels like the most important match in the entire world. And it can certainly feel that way. I've been there. I've been there in my junior career and high school and college. Um, I, I've been there. So, you know, it, it can be, especially if there's that gap we're talking about where you want your UTR to be, you know, higher than it is. And, you know, you feel like, okay, this match, this is my opportunity. I don't know, you know, when my next match will be, I need to really have a great performance here to raise that UTR. This is my opportunity to do it. I need to do it. I should do it. I'm supposed to, um, using all of those same types of words that we talked about. Um, but in, in reality, if we can, you know, take a step, step back, zoom out a little bit, have the type of perspective that where we can realize that, okay, this is, this is just another match. This is another milestone. Yes, it might feel important. It might be important, but it is practice for my next match. It's one step along my journey as a tennis player. Um, that's, that's the type of mindset where we're not going to feel as much pressure going into that match. And we're ultimately going to have a better chance to actually play our game and actually play well because we're, we'll likely feel looser. We'll likely be able to think more clearly rather than feeling like, rather than being obsessed with the score and obsessed with winning and obsessed with using this one match to raise our UTR. And it would be pretty easy for some you know young player to be skeptical of this point of view. To say, well, but wait, it's not practice. It counts. There are points. My UTR will be affected, etc. cetera. Um, but as you stated, when we think that way, we put a whole lot more pressure on ourselves. And what you're presenting, what we're both presenting is, is a way to take pressure off, which for most players helps them perform better. And so what do you have to lose? You know, if you're struggling with all this pressure and I need to, and I should beat, et cetera, and it's not working, what's the objection to trying something different that takes some pressure off that is more controllable? Um, if you like it, you stick with it. If you don't, you can go. You're, there's nothing stopping you going back, right? But I think to be a great player, to be great at anything, you, one must be open-minded. One must be willing to be a student, and in some ways, one must be willing to be a beginner and and have that beginner's mindset. Um, and so, whatever the resistance might be to something like everything is practice, and that's really a mental construct that you can deal with more so right what is what is why are you resisting trying this um, to try to lower the pressure and i think we also see josh when it comes to utr not just our own utr so this is one of the funny sort of paradoxical things so like you know my my utr is wrong but everybody else's is correct and that's how people look at their matchups well, I'm supposed to beat so-and-so. She's, you know, a point below me. And you're assuming right away that her UTR is right, yours is wrong. How do you know hers isn't wrong? <laughs> Maybe she's supposed to be a point higher than than what she is. And it so now not only do we judge ourselves, we begin to judge the matchups. And, oh, I should beat this someone. Or, you know, it even goes on the other end. Um... Maybe we give too much respect to somebody who's a little bit higher. Or, you know, I'm sure you've seen this, Josh. When we play somebody higher, you know, one of your report your your players will probably say something, well, I didn't feel any pressure. I had nothing to lose. They were two points higher than me. I played great. Right there, what does that tell you? That you play better when there's no pressure on. So everything you can do to remove pressure is probably going to help you play better. And so if we can conceptualize ideas around practice, competition, improvement that allow you to stay focused on what you can control in those moments, UTR will take care of itself. But if we're going into matchups thinking, well, I should win, I need to win, you know, at least two and two, if not better than that in order to improve my ranking, um, what's going to happen when it's three all? 
in the first set. What are you going to be thinking? That's It's going to be something very difficult to deal with. What are you going to be thinking when you're playing a backdraw match against somebody whose UTR is, say, just a half a point below yours? How are you going to feel about that if UTR and winning is your primary focus? And don't mistake us here. We're never, we're not saying don't play to win. And in fact, that's a huge part of you learning is that you're always playing to win. You always have that positive intent of trying to win the match, of keep fighting. So we're not saying that at all. But that's a controllable piece, that effort level, that focus level that goes into competing that way. So we're not saying that you playing to win isn't important. Playing to win is probably the most important thing um, or one of the most important things. But the actual winning of it in the end is not controllable. And, and for what we're talking about, learning is the most important thing. Every player loses at some point. It's pretty rare to see players who have, um, well, an undefeated record is, I think, almost impossible depending on what level you're playing at. Um, but everybody loses. Everybody loses points, games, matches. And so that's just part of the reality. Uh, but can, if we focus more on learning, you can become undefeated in learning. Can you make sure you always learn something to get out of this match? That, And the better you become at that, the more you make the environment about learning. I think this is a Bill Walsh quote, former uh, football coach of the San Francisco 49ers. You know, the more that the environment is about learning, the results will come. And if you can trust that, and I've seen that with so many of my my uh, players, Josh, and I'm sure you've seen it. Um, but it's one of those things you have to have your players experience it to really believe it. So, yeah, you and I are talking about this today and preaching a little bit about how one could possibly handle this better. But ultimately... For those listening, you're gonna to have to try to you're gonna to have to make the leap of faith and see how it works for you, and really embody that. Uh, if you can do it, I believe it will work for you. Um, and what do you have to lose at this point if if UTR is something you're struggling with? Absolutely, and I think I think a lot of players you you mentioned earlier, you know, people when maybe they're playing somebody who's a point or two points higher in terms of UTR, they don't feel that pressure. And they play great. And I think I think many players have probably had that experience where if they can think back to some of their best performances, some of their best results, they've probably played best when they haven't had as much pressure on them, when they probably weren't thinking about the score as much. They were, you know, focusing on something controllable, focusing on the ball, focusing on their footwork, focusing maybe more on their strategy, focusing on one of these controllable factors. And you know, and, and enjoying the process, enjoying the match um, rather than fixating so much about the score and saying, okay, it's three all. I'm supposed to have won this set, you know, and, and, and lost two games or less in this set. And and then you're thinking about your UTR and how this match is going to affect your UTR rather than focusing on what you have to do to beat the player who's on the other side of the net from you. So, um, no, I, I think, you know, I think as a starting point, you know, people can really try to think about those situations. Okay, when did I, when do I play my best? When do I not play my best? What are those situations where I don't play my best? Is it when I feel a lot of pressure on myself, whether it's from, you know, self-imposed pressure or from somebody else or, you know, things that I'm telling myself, like I need to do this, I'm supposed to do this, you know, I need to beat this person by this score. Um, and then also, you know, spending 10, 15 minutes and trying to really understand what, how does the UTR algorithm work, right? A lot of, as we talked about, a lot of people are wrapped up in this algorithm and maybe they don't fully understand how it works. And it's not all, it's pretty transparent, but it's not, you know, it, it's not as if you can figure out every single aspect of it, but there is a lot of information on the website. And, you know, we, Brian, you brought up the example of someone's, someone not even playing a tournament in a week and then their UTR changing. And this is, you know, it's because the people that you've played against, they've played tournaments that week, their UTR has gone up or gone down. 
And that's impacted yours based on your results against those people. Um, also understanding how long matches stay on your record for, um, you know, there, I, I believe, and maybe you may know this better than me. I believe if you play someone more than two points higher or lower, it doesn't actually count for correct. your UTR. That's correct. Um, so just understanding some of these intricacies and some of these details um, can, can maybe change your perspective on it. Cause I think a lot, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people maybe have a negative feeling about UTR for certain reasons and because maybe they feel like if it doesn't reflect them, oh, I feel like this type of player, my UTR doesn't reflect me. Therefore, I don't like the system itself. Um, and as I said, I don't think it's a perfect system, but I think it, you know, be, before you get to that point, let's try to really understand it. And then let, let's try to make sure that UTR and things related to UTR aren't getting in your head when you're out there. But instead, that, that you can use, you know, UTR as simply a metric, simply sort of a, a judge of where you're at right now. And, you know, be able to use that information. Understand why, you know, Iga Sviantek is rated what she is. Understand why, you know, Djokovic and Medvedev are, are rated what, what, you know, what they are. Um, really try to understand how the system works. You know, what what does a 16 you know, level player look like? What does a 13 level player look like? You know, just, just under, try to understand more about this system. And I think it, you know, it, it can almost depersonalize it a little bit where it's not like, okay, my rating isn't reflected where instead, okay, this is just, these are just simply the numbers. This is just simply what's happened based on my results. My results are not fixed. They can continue to change based on me, focusing on different areas of my game, my mindset and my attitude being a big one, you know, my, my, my game, my strategy, my tactics being a big one, my hydration, my nutrition, my sleep, my, you know, my technical aspects of my game certainly as well. Um, so understanding, you know, okay, this is where I'm at and think about over these next three months or six months, if I make these changes in my game, if I make improvements to my mental game, if I make improvements in terms of my fitness, what what could be possible? So seeing it, you know, rather than in this fixed way as, okay, this is my UTR and this is where it will always be as, you know, sort of trying to see it in a growth mindset type of a way and understanding, you know, understanding how that can change over time. And so I think to help get us there, each one of us needs to conceptualize UTR in a new way such that it isn't a barrier now to our performance. It, it simply is part of the, you know, part of the landscape. It's part of reality, but we don't want it to be a, you know, if we use our performance equation, you know, actual performance equals potential minus interference. We don't want it to be a reason that our actual performance was say a five out of 10 was, I was so focused on, I had to win and, and so forth. We have to come up with some perspectives that allow us to put UTR to the side, understand it's not fully controllable. It has a use. And, but if we can understand how to lower pressure or look at UTR differently, and you know, that might be something that each person has to do for themselves. We have certainly tried to give some ways of thinking around that, like everything is practice, um, focusing more on who you are becoming rather than who you are right now, focusing on more controllable things, understanding competition as a process and how it's helping you to master all these things and taking that leap of faith that if I work on these controllable items, I will eventually see the results that I want. You know, I think we can speak from experience that all, all those things could, could certainly help, but it really comes down to the individual to determine what is a way of thinking about it that will help um, that person take the pressure off <clears throat> and not let their self-worth and self-esteem be determined by, um, by this algorithm you know, that we can't, can't fully control. So I think what's also interesting, Josh, is you know, outside of, say, the college environment or the recruiting environment, Utah isn't as much of a big deal. Um, you know, I work with some players who are high 13s. They couldn't care less 
about UTR. Now, of course, you know, they're working on pro careers. And yes, all the pros have UTRs, but nobody really cares about it because it's not used for any particular purpose there other than uh, maybe sort of interesting to see how different players may match up, but it's not used for seeding or anything else. Um, and so perhaps it's not cared about so much because it isn't used. Uh, but they, they rarely think about their their UTR. I think to a certain extent, you know, once you're on a college team, players think about it, especially if they're underperforming. Um, but it's less than, I would say, uh, for players who are at the, the recruiting process or in the recruiting process. I don't know if you found that when you were at, at Sacred Heart. You know, I went in my time at Boston College and in some work with Bryant University. There was not that much talk about UTR, um, except maybe relative to other teams. It was certainly a good tool for us to use as coaches to see how we would match up in specific positions. So that was actually a pretty cool feature of the, of the tool is allowing you to kind of move your lineup around and see how you match up. But it was less of a, a pressure thing on the actual players and more of a coaching tool to see how our team would match up versus versus another but it wasn't really the source of uh, self-worth for many players um, so you know perhaps just with that perspective in mind are there ways for players to develop new you know new ways of thinking with respect to UTR so that it doesn't become uh, a barrier to you becoming that great player to you reaching your goal um, but really just a system of measurement and helping you understand where you are in the moment remember it never, defines who you can be. Um, only you can do that. But it's, it's simply just who you are, who, or really who this algorithm sees you as today. Right. And it doesn't define who you can be, and it really doesn't define who you are. It's a number that's reflecting your recent results, and that's what it is. Yeah. And maybe there are some implications of that. But I, I think we, we've also talked on the show about not over identifying with our results and not making that who we are because we won't always have those results. We won't always be, you know, whatever, like uh, we won't always be that college player or that high school player trying to, you know, make it onto a college team. Our tennis, you know, tennis career will come to an end at some point. Our, you know, our high school career or college career will, will come to an end. We, we, want to base our self-worth and our self-identity off of more than that. Tennis is something that we do. And, you know, as you've said, Brian, it, it can be our, our life project it can be something that we aspire to, you know, playing as well as possible and to using this as a tool to develop our, our character and our, us as people as well. Um, but not, we never want to get to the point where we are defined by our results because they're uncontrollable. We want to be thinking of ourselves um, and, you know, basing our, are worth basing, you know, sort of how we view ourselves off of things like, you know, the things that we can actually impact and control. Um, what does our attitude look like each day? What does our effort level look like each day? Um, how is our sportsmanship, right? How are we using our minds out there to try to be a great competitor? How are we trying to, you know, focus on these types of things that ultimately impact our performance in our, in our, um, results, but but not having results being first and foremost, I think is um, needs needs to be more of a, a priority. Yeah, and this will take some time. You know, in the players I've worked with, we have these conversations early on, and there's definitely an adoption process to it. You know, it doesn't happen right away, and um, for some players, it can happen relatively quickly, maybe three months, uh, others maybe more in the three to six months, but, but it really all depends on the player, um, you know, himself or herself about how much they can buy into this process. And um, the more that the player can buy into the process of improvement and learning, um, the better and the faster that that will, that that will go. Uh, but know that this is probably not a snap your fingers I've reconfigured how I think about UTR and everything is going to be great. It's just not how human minds work. It takes a lot of repetition of these new ways of thinking 
before they can take hold. So the things that we're asking or uh, suggesting, don't just try it once, oh, that didn't work, and and then just go back to what you were doing. Um, you have to give it really some uh, some amount of time and real commitment. Uh, and, and I think if you do, you will see some real improvement in, in how you play, how you handle pressure, how you compete. But you should expect it to be probably somewhere between three to six to nine months of work in order to get there. But I think if you can do it, super valuable and super rewarding. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, understanding that that, sh- that shift in mindset um, will have an impact on your results, a, a, a positive impact. It may not be immediate, um, but, you know, it, it's almost like focusing a little bit less on the results itself and focusing instead on how you get there ends up at the end of the day having a bigger impact on those results in a positive way. But it it does require that leap of faith. It does require sort of, you know, that you're not constantly thinking about them, not constantly looking at the results, trusting that the results are based on those ingredients, that process of high performance and really focusing your efforts in those areas. Yeah. So good discussion, Josh. Um, you know, UTR is here to stay. So I think it's important that we talk about that that topic. And I know it's something that comes up in a lot of your discussions. It comes up in a lot of my discussions and it's, um, it's important to help athletes reconceptualize their, their thoughts here. So uh, I enjoyed that discussion. Um, and so that's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Uh, for more on today's episode, please check out the show notes. If you have any feedback or questions for me and Josh, please email us at tennisiqpodcast at gmail.com. You can also use the Twitter hashtag tennisiq. Additionally, please subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice, including YouTube, so you can be notified of new episodes. You can also check us out on Instagram. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon in our next episode.